Welcome everyone to the very first day of Reptile and Amphibian Days. We are so excited that you're here with us today. So um, we are really excited about our program, Live Animal Care at the Museum, Enrichment and Training. And so every program, we start with a really fun icebreaker question. Question. So we're going to talk about how we enrich our animals and train them at the museum. So when we speak about enrichment, what we um, want you to understand, so our animals live in captivity. So in the wild, they would have to evade predators, and they would have to find food, and they would have to find a mate. All these things that um, require a lot of um, activity and action and thinking. But so in captivity, they don't have to do those things. And so we can give them different things in their lives to make them exhibit more natural behaviors and have them have a more enjoyable life. So what the question I want you to answer, what is enriching for you? What do you do for fun? So put that in the chat. And as we go on today um, during our program, if you have any questions for our experts, I want you to put those in the chat and we'll, we'll ask them during the program. I also want to make sure that everybody um, understands that the chat is for uh, questions and comments that are relevant to the program. So keep it nice, keep it kind, keep it respectful, um, and put your questions in there. We want to hear from you. All right, so I'm going to introduce our experts today. So Alex and Raina are curators of reptiles, amphibians, and ambassador animals at the at North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So Alex and Raina, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for welcoming us. We're very excited to be here. Um, my name is Alex, um, and then this is Raina. Um, we are going to be showing you some enrichment that we use for our animals here at the museum in our living collections. So we work in living collections and the animals that we're going to be showing today are permanent residents here at the museum and they each have jobs to do. So some of the animals are used for exhibits. So they educate people by showing an example of that animal out on the floor. When people visit the museum, they can see those animals and become familiar with them. Uh, our animals in our backup spaces are our ambassador animals. They are ambassadors for their species. And they are used in programs um, by our educators to show these animals and teach about them. So those are the animals that we're going to be showing today. And we are super excited about it. Uh, Carrie, are we ready to move forward? Do you have anything you want to add? I think that's it. Let's talk about enrichment and training. I'm so excited. Yay. All right. So we are going to move forward. We are going to start off with encouraging some natural behaviors in our bearded dragon. We are going to move forward over his enrichment area over here. A lot of times, uh, animals in captivity, when we're feeding them, we might feed them directly off tongs, or we might put their food in a nice little bowl for them. So here we have a nice little bowl of mealworms. Bearded dragons love to eat bugs, and they love mealworms. Ours certainly does. And instead of giving them in the bowl, uh, we're going to mix it up in some dirt for him. Uh, and that way, we're going to encourage him to kind of dig for it. So. Animals in the wild might have to dig for their food. If the bugs like to bury themselves in the dirt, we're going to try to bury some of these worms. We're going to leave a couple of them uncovered so that he knows there's some food in there. And we're going to bring them out. Here's our bearded dragon. If you want to bring the tripod over here, you can see if he wants to dig for some mealworms today. And all of our enrichment here at the museum is voluntary. So that means that sometimes the animals might choose that they don't want to interact with their enrichment today. And some of our animals on our program today may decide that they don't want to dig in the dirt today or whatever it is we have planned for them. And that's okay too. So we can talk about them and we can view them. Ooh, and there he goes, he found his first one. Um, and 
we can see if he decides he wants to dig in the dirt for more. Do you guys have any, you have any questions about bearded dragons? Not yet, but this is really adorable. I look at him going for it. Oh, he just sucked another one up. So that is wonderful. So, um, so tell us a little bit about bearded dragons. Where are they from? Bearded dragons are actually from all the way over in Australia, which is very far away, which can seem surprising considering how common they are in the pet trade in North America. So it is actually uh, against the law now to collect these animals from the wild in their natural habitat in Australia. Um, however, they do well in captivity and are very commonly bred. So thankfully, they no longer need to be taken from their homes in the wild to be good pets over here. Um, and so this animal, uh, like others that you would see in the U.S., are uh, captive bred. That's uh, awesome. So I have another question. So um, our animals at the museum are not pets. So what is their job? I mean, so so what would it, we use a bearded dragon for? Um, so this bearded dragon is a program animal. Uh, so he has a very important job to educate the public. And so he's used in lots of programs. Some of them are specific to bearded dragons and um, their counterparts in the wild to educate people. And uh, some of the programs he's used for are for, to teach about general anatomy and to teach about lizards. Um, and so that is very true. So even though some of the animals that we have here at the museum, some people might also have as pets, none of the animals that we're gonna show today are pets. Um, and some of the animals might be illegal to keep as pets that we're gonna show today. So it's important to keep that in mind. That's awesome. So we do have a question from the chat and it's actually a fantastic question because it's one of my favorite things to talk about with bearded dragons. So someone wants to know, are they spiky? They are a little bit spiky, especially on their chin. So that's where they get their name, uh, bearded dragon, is because they have little spikes on their chin that whenever they puff them out, they can actually look black. And what that does is if someone is coming, if a predator is coming or if something scary is coming towards the bearded dragon, he'll puff up his spiny chin and to a predator, they don't want to eat spines that would hurt their mouth. So it'll scare the predator away. Even though in reality, whenever you touch a bearded dragon's spines, they're actually not painful. I think that's really neat. They also have spines along their sides and you can rub your finger on them and they're actually like, they're kind of floppy almost, I would say, right? They're, they're not very, they don't like stick out and poke you like, like you would maybe think of when you look at them. Yeah, that is very true. Their spines are surprisingly not very hard. Right. I've got another question. Um, so Nancy says she's a patch on his tail and she wants to know if that's some skin left from the last shed and do they shed in patches? I think that's a great question because I think lizards shed a lot differently than say like a snake, right? Yeah, that is very true. That is a little bit of a shed patch left from his last shed. And these guys do shed in patches. So while a snake will a lot of times shed its uh, whole body at one time, um, a lizard can't really do that because um, they have a much more complex body shape. And so they will shed bits and pieces at a time uh, and this guy just has a little bit left from his last shed. I love how he's like looking around. He's like, are there any more in here? All right. So Emily, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Colette wants to know why is his head shaped that way? That's so a think, fantastic yeah. question. Um, and there may be more reasons than this, but one of the big reasons why he's shaped that way is so that he can make the best use of his really big spiny beard. Um, so because his head is so wide, when he shows his beard, it makes it look really, really big. Um, whereas if his head was more thin, like some other lizards, it might not show as well. Awesome. And so Katrina says she's noticing the height of the box and she wants to know, are they good climbers or jumpers? Um, these guys are surprisingly good climbers uh, and pretty crafty. Uh, they don't do a ton of jumping, 
but they can definitely climb a lot better than you might expect. So we do try and keep tall walls. Awesome. And so I have a question because to me, their physique, it really resembles something like a crevice lizard. Um, and so do they do that same kind of behavior where if they're threatened by a predator, would they like, kind of cram themselves into a crevice and, and puff up and maybe that's where those side spines would come in handy? That makes sense. I could definitely do, see them doing something like that. Um, these guys are really common in uh, rocky habitats uh, in their um, native areas of Australia. And so that would definitely be a great way for them to uh, get away from a predator. But I like I like how he's how he's licking his lips. He's like yeah, he, he that wants was, he's like, that was delicious. <laughs> yes, he hasn't quite figured out how to get the ones that are more deeply buried. But I think that we need to move on to our next animal. Uh, so we're going to go and we're going to see our friend the red-footed tortoise. All right. Bye, Beardy. So this is our red-footed tortoise right here, and what we're going to do for him is we've got some produce items, and we're going to blow his water for him. And so what that's going to do is we're going to kind of encourage him, make it a little bit more difficult to get his food than normal. So on an average day, he would eat his food off of a tray. Uh, and today we're going to encourage him to come into the water. So this accomplishes a couple of goals. One, we're encouraging him to hopefully get a good soak. Um, the, it's really healthy for these guys to soak in water um, to kind of, you know, help keep their skin nice and soft, although they're reptiles, so it's not as soft as mammal skin. But we're going to encourage him to get in the water. The other thing is, is that this is going to, again, make it a little bit more difficult for him to get his food. And we're going to try and get his brain working to figure out what to do um, to get it out of the water. We're going to see. We're going to see if he decides he wants to get in. I think I can see his brain working. He definitely is interested in the food items. I think he's just trying to figure out if he if it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> to go in there. <laughs> Right. So, so I have, um, I'm just going to have one question to go back to the, uh, to the, the um, beardy. They want to know how many worm, mealworms can a bearded dragon eat? I don't so, know if it's in one sitting or. <laughs> they, they'll pretty much eat until they're full, which, so that can be any, like five to like 20 to yeah, it depends on more, or uh, depending on how hungry the bearded dragon is. Um, but normally, we would only feed maybe five to ten um, because bearded dragons can uh, put on a little too much weight if you give them as many worms as they want. I, do, I remember I used to have a tarantula, and um, I was told n not to give her mealworms because every mealworm was like a milkshake <laughs> and that crickets were way healthier. Um, all right. Awesome. So he's thinking about it, huh? Yeah, he is very deep in thought. We'll see. So he may decide he doesn't want to get in his water today and that is okay. Um, if he doesn't want to do it, then he does not have to today. And he may decide that he wants to come back later whenever there aren't a bunch of people watching and he wants to. Right, come. right. He's, he's shy. So, so if he decides um, he doesn't want to go for the plunge, then how long will you leave the food in there? Um, <laughs> we still only leave the food in there. Here? Yeah, nope. <laughs> I'm going home now. That was too much work. He's done. <laughs> I think that, that that goes back to I think some, something you were mentioning before that they that they always have a choice, right? They don't we don't force them or compel them to do any of these activities. It's their choice if they want to do them, right? Right. 
sad. Oh, poking his little nose Ooh. back out. He's, he's, <laughs> he, he's turned, he turned around. <laughs> he's bringing his All house right. with him. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions about our, our red-footed tortoise uh, before we... Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so Katrina wants to know how far can he stretch his head out? Oh, that's a great question. So just a minute ago, whenever we were watching him, so we can kind of see him now, that's about as far as he can go. And I'd say that's maybe about four or five inches. Um, so surprisingly far, um, but not as far as some other turtles. There are some like snake neck turtles or mata matas that have very, very long necks. Um, this guy does not have nearly as long a neck as that. Um, what you're seeing now is about as far as he can go. All right. And so, so where are red-footed tortoises from, and where and where did we get ours at the museum? Where we got ours at the museum is a great question that I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. Um, but these guys originate from northern South America, um, and they like to live in a variety of habitats. So. These guys actually have a very wide range in South America because they can do well in savanna habitats and woodland habitats and grassland habitats. Um, and so because they can do well in such a variety of different habitats, they're pretty generalist in that sense. Um, these guys have a really wide range. Awesome. And so um, John wants to know how old is he? And I... I am curious um, not how old he is, but also how long do they live? Those are fantastic questions. We actually don't know how old this individual is. Um, I believe he came to the museum as an adult. Um, I could be wrong about that. I'm not quite sure if his origin here at the museum, but I do know that he's been here for 13 years. Uh, so He's been here at the museum uh, much longer than I have been here at the museum. <laughs> That's how long I've been at the museum. <laughs> so we, oh, awesome. we started at the same time. Actually, Reptile and Amphibian Day is my, my anniversary at the museum. So, um, oh, so great. So, yeah, so we're, we've been here the same amount of time. <laughs> and, I have a question. Oh, yeah. And how long do they live? Yes, they can actually live to be up to about 50 years. So these guys can live a really long time. Wow. Um, and so John wants to know, is it a boy or a girl? Um, that is a great question. I believe this one is a male. And so I have, I have a question. So um, do you, can you tell like males and females by the, the clown cave plastron, like on a box turtle, or do they have a different, are they different? Um, it is, it is very similar to a box turtle. I don't believe it's as pronounced on these guys, but they do still have the concave flash on. Oh, cool. Back it up. He can't decide. All right. Well, I think <laughs> it's about time that we move on to our next animals. Sounds good. All right, buddy. Well, you go back to that after we leave, okay? Those look like <laughs> good items. And we are going to go. We are going to see our... Um, Frogs that uh, visitors might remember from our discovery room. This is our American goat, our Australian frog. They are in a special separate room that helps them keep cool in here. And we also keep the weight a little bit. So, so, Ale so Alex, maybe, um, we're having trouble, a little bit of difficulty with the audio. So, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, so, so, I, so if you don't mind kind of introducing our friends again, please. Of course. All right. So we are coming in here. So these are um, animals that you might originally recognize if you have visited the museum um, before the museum closed originally back um, last month. March last year, these are animals from our discovery room. So you can see our green tree frog up there at the top, and then he's got a bit of a light on him, so he's a little bit hard to see right now, but you can just barely see our Cope's gray tree frog um, on a branch over there. Um, and so these animals usually live in our discovery room, um, which is where some of our youngest museum visitors like to hang out. 
But uh, right now, because the discovery room is closed, these guys are hanging out in our backup space. Um, and we're going to talk about some enrichment that we do for them. And so one of the big ways that we do enrichment for these guys is we've given them a very enriching living space. So looking at this, we can talk about really enriching living spaces and some of the different things that we've done for this enclosure. So if you look at it, you can see in their house, their mister system is running right now. Um, that keeps it nice and humid in there. Um, they like it whenever they get misted. And then if we're looking, we can see that we have a wide variety of branches for them to choose to climb on. And if you look towards the back, we can see that we have live plants in here. So what we've done by adding these tree branches, we've created a mimic of, and they like plants, we're creating a mimic of their natural habitat, um, which as close as we can get to that for these animals, um, the more enriched habitat they're going to have. So a couple other areas where we have added to this habitat is they have a water feature. So if you look over to the left over here, these animals, especially our Pope's gray tree frog, love wetlands. So you can see over here, they have a water feature area where they can completely go in the water if they choose to. Um, and we have the branches for those guys. Now our American toad is a little different. He doesn't like to climb. They like to burrow. And so you can see here, we have this rounded piece of pork bark and you may not be able to see it from the tripod, but if we come over here, you can see there's a little hole in it. Um, and if we lower down, you can just barely see inside. And he's got a little cave in there. Uh, and so by making that little cave for him, he's got an area where he can hide underground as well. So we've created an area here where we've got multiple different species and an enriching habitat that is suitable for all three of them. I think that's so cool. So that's so you would call that a, a toad abode, right? It is a toad abode. <laughs> yes. And I think that this is so wonderful because these three species do live together. Um, and, you know, we can find all of these animals. If you live in the Triangle area, these are all in our backyard. Um, and so I like, I'm seeing the green tree frog. He's moving around now. So that's fun. Um, oh, the coops just jumped on him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's fantastic. So I have a question. So does, with the green tree frog, does he like to, to, to climb on the plants? Does it seem, um, cause you know, he camouflages with the green. Yeah, so the live plants that are in here right now are actually a little bit small to support his weight, um, but they will grow much bigger. And so that's one of the really fun things about having live plants in an enclosure like this is that over time, the, as the live plants grow, the features of the enclosure will grow and change with them. Uh, and so that's one of the things that's really enriching about having live plants is that it creates a changing environment. That's so fun. And I love how they're, uh, you know, I'm sure they don't consider each other friends. They're just encountering each other, but it's still pretty cute for them both to be sitting on the same stick. Yeah. And that is actually another one of the reasons why we like to group house animals in certain situations where we feel like that uh, it, it won't create a negative benefit is that it can be also be a good enrichment for animals to have an opportunity to interact with uh, other individuals, even other individuals that are not of the same species, just like how these animals might see each other in the wild. Absolutely. I think that that, you know, I think that we oftentimes overlook those interactions if they're not like, you know, like, a ma you know, male and female of the same species or predator prey relationships, that there are all these relationships in the wild of animals of different species interacting from birds, different species of birds communicating to each other with threats and um, and things like that. So I think that that is really, really neat. So um, Katrina, um, her question is, do they actually interact? Like, do they notice each other or do they just ignore each other for the most part? Um, they, for the most part, they do ignore each other. We have seen some interactions with them. I have seen some interactions um, between the green tree frog and the toad. 
Uh, he'll get down on the floor and then notice the toad and they'll kind of look back and forth at each other. And then the green tree frog will hop away. Um, <laughs> him and, he is not the biggest fan of the toad, but that's okay. And so most of the time they ignore each other and live side by side, um, but there will occasionally be small interactions. That's so fun. And I love that we got to see an interaction during during this program. That's really cool. Yeah, that was awesome. Do we have any other questions before we move on? I think I think we're ready to move on. Fantastic. Um, we are moving on to a very special type of enrichment next. Um, we are going to go see our juvenile alligators. Um, we're going to be a bit of a maneuver in getting out of this small room. There we go. Oh, Emily had a question. What was the species of the frog on the right? That's the Cope's gray tree frog. That's the grayish one. And then the green tree frog was the green one. That is correct. All right. So we're going to talk about training um, just for a little bit. Um, so these are our American alligators uh, here at the museum. And these are juveniles. So a full grown American alligator would be much, much bigger. And these guys are very little um, compared to an adult. Uh, so um, these guys are about one and a half. They are less than two years old. So they are pretty young for a bear. Um, and we have started doing some training with them. So these are not trained animals. They are in training. And one of the reasons why we do the training is that it is enriching for them. It is a type of enrichment. And so one of the reasons why it is, is because it engages their brain. It gets them thinking. So it creates a challenge to get the food out of them. So we ask for a command. We, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle at the beginning. We communicate with them. What is the command? What is it we want them to do? And then they have to use their brains to figure out what it is that they need to do in order to get the food or the reward. So right now we're working with these gators to train them to come to a target. Um, another benefit of that, other than just enrichment, is it also gives us a way to get the gator to a certain part of the enclosure. So for whatever reason we needed them to be in the water or if we needed them to come on land, we would use our target stick we have here. Ours is just a little booty on the end of the pole. Um, and we would put it in there and ask them to come to the target. Um, they would come to the target and then we would give them a reward. And that way we can get them to go where we need them to go. So these animals, we're in the process of teaching them how to do this. So we're gonna show how we teach them. So this guy, this is right here, is quite well. If he's a little bit more confident, a smaller gator is more to it. We're not going to show him on the program today because he's pretty shy, and I don't think he would appreciate that. Um, I don't know, he's a little bit like me. So we're going to put our target in the water, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to give a command first. He probably will not respond to it um, because he still hasn't quite figured out what that means yet, but we're going to give him a try. All right. Nope, oh, he's looking. There he goes. Target. Um, and so one of the ways that we're going to come point target. 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 So what food items are you using? So we are feeding them fish today. We encourage them to come to the target. Um, and you saw that when he came towards the target, I said yes, and then pressed my little clicker button. Uh, and the reason that we do that is because that is how we're communicating to the animal. 
Yes, that was what I wanted you to do. So when I show him the fish and he comes towards the target, then we're going to tell him, yes, that was correct. Um, and the way that we established that at the beginning is we would start off doing something like this and get in the fish. Yes. And if we do that enough times, that's, that'll teach him, oh, yes, and the clicky noise means, oh, I get a fish. So um, Nancy wants to know, are they quick learners? And how long does it take before they respond to the target? That is a great question. Um, so these guys take longer to train than mammals do. Um, and a big part of the reason for that is that they don't eat nearly as often. So cold-blooded animals, like a gator, is going to eat less often than a mammal is, which means that they're also welcome to be less motivated. So, they're going to be less likely to, um, you know, immediately come immediately. And the other thing is, is that we have less opportunities for training sessions. With a mammal, you would have a training session every day. At max, with these guys, we can do a training session three times a week. So usually it takes a few months to train a behavior like this. That's awesome. Um, and so are alligators... Can, can we train any reptile like this, or are alligators special? So, they are a little bit special um, because they um, have a lot more capacity for learning. So, they're going to pick up stuff a lot faster than a lot of other animals. Um, the other thing is for some reptiles that would make training really difficult, uh, for snakes, for example, is they would, a lot of snakes only eat once a week to once a month. And that would make it training incredibly difficult because it's, it's really difficult to establish a behavior on such a long time frame between sessions. Um, so, gators are usually more likely to be chosen for training for those reasons. However, most animals uh, can be trained. Um, they just is a more difficult for other animals. Gators are some of the most trainable reptiles. Awesome. Um, so Katrina wants to know, do older or more trained gators eventually come running as soon as they see the target without hearing the command first? Um, yes, that absolutely can happen. Um, and so a lot of times if, we're, if you're group housing animals, um, what you would want to do is you would want to use targets of different colors. Um, so that even if you had a different command word, the gator would know to only come if it's their color target. Um, so yes, that is very true. A lot of times they will come towards the target without saying a command word. And if you're in a position where you don't want them to do that, then you would also need to add to your training instances in which you put the target in the water, you do not say target, and the animal does not get a reward when they come to the target. Um, for our situation, we wouldn't train that. So ours will come to the target immediately a lot of times once they're trained. Um, but in other facilities, if that's needed, then that can also be trained. So they would only come if the command is set. That is really cool. So that makes me curious about their vision because you're talking about using different colors. So yeah, so what is their vision like? That's a great question. Um, gators have great vision. Um, and as far as color vision goes, I'm not entirely certain if they see colors the same as humans do, but I know they definitely can see a wide variety of colors. That's so cool. I guess I never thought about gator vision before, but that's really neat. Yeah. Um, so Katrina wants to know, is that a dog clicker? And if so, how is their hearing range compared to dogs and cats? And then, uh, and then Missy, I'm going to piggyback on that. Missy wants to know, do they listen well? That is a fantastic question. Yes, it is a dog clicker. Um, so the reason that we use that is because we have different trainers, especially right now, um, when we're having to work on two separate shifts due to the pandemic. Um, if one shift were to get sick, there's still a group of people who have not been exposed can come in and take care of the animals. So that means that on the opposite shift, we have to have at least two different trainers. 
Uh, and so the clicker is really important because even though while we're speaking, voices might sound different, there's always a sound in there that is consistent every time, no matter who's doing the training. Um, so it is a dog clipper. As far as their hearing, as compared to dogs and cats, I'm not quite sure as the comparison, but they can hear surprisingly well, um, especially for a that is so interesting. And what a good point about using the clicker because different, because of course you'll have different people doing the trainings at different times. Um, and so that's really, really interesting. So um, so just, I'd like to just talk a little bit about alligator natural history. So alligators are native to North Carolina, right? That is right. They are native to the uh, southeastern U.S. So they're a little more common, a little bit um, more south, especially like South Carolina. Um, but we do get them up here in North Carolina. Awesome. And so, in, in ours, as you said, ours are um, a year and a half, right? So they're, so they're baby alligators. So since we're a downtown museum, um, we can't have, you know, a 13-foot alligator. So what do, we, what do we do with the alligators when they get too big? That is a fantastic question. So... We have an arrangement with another facility named Alligator Adventure, uh, which has large outdoor enclosures for their adult gators. Uh, and whenever they do breeding projects with gators, um, they will send us a couple of young gators so that they can be ambassadors for their species uh, here at the museum. And then once they get too big to be used for programming, uh, they can go back to alligator adventure where they can live in those big open outdoor enclosures. Uh, and then if alligator adventure does another breeding project, um, they will send us more of the young gators. So it's a really great setup. Yeah, that's awesome. I always I always think of it like they get to retire in the sun. Yeah. That is <laughs> All right, so Carissa has a question. Will the alligator eat a salamander? That is a great question. Um, I don't know that in the wild it would be super common, um, especially just because uh, normally salamanders are taller and their range doesn't overlap, overlap a whole lot. Um, however, I'm sure that if given the opportunity, uh, they would take it. Uh, these guys are uh, strictly carnivores, but whenever it comes to what they eat, um, in that, they are pretty generalist. So cool. All right. Oh, so in yeah, Susan, how many baby alligators do we have? We currently have two. So we have Tyrell here, and then over there we have Brunswick. Uh, he's much older and more shy. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that's it for our participant questions. Fantastic. Well, I think we're going to move to our next animal. We're going to go see our copperhead. Woohoo. So Alex is heading into the venomous room right now. So these are where all of our venomous um, reptiles are housed for the museum. favorite food 
which is mice, and it actually has some little mouse ears on there. And we're going to put it in here for him, and we're going to see if he wants to come out and smell it. He's in his human high right now, so he may decide he doesn't really want to. Um, but if we're lucky, he may decide that he wants to come out and investigate uh, and see what it's all about. And I'm going to walk past the camera right here. Let's see if we can see what he's doing. Maybe close that, and then if you want to pull the camera up a little closer, you can. We can see if we can see him. He's in his cubit hide right now. So, because you know this is a venomous animal, um, I, I do. You, can you talk a little bit about the safety protocol that you're using? Um, so yep. I noticed you opened the enclosure with the snake hook and closed it with the snake hook. So um, yep. I just want everybody to, to, to understand that, you know, that we have some really strict um, safety protocols. Oh, that's a good, that's a good view. I, we can, we can see it now inside the enclosure. Yep. So we have to be really strict. So uh, when any time we're opening the enclosure, we never want to open it with our hands. We always open it with the pool. And if we're putting anything in or taking anything out of the enclosure, we use a tool for that also. We use our big grabbers. Um, and so that way, we never go within what we call strike range of the animal, which just means that we never want to get close enough to the animal that he could bite us. So um, Missy has a question. Do we have scorpions in the venomous room? So we do have scorpions here at the museum. Um, however, ours are not venomous enough to be what we would consider code red uh, or like dangerous to a human. Uh, and therefore our scorpions are not housed in the venomous. We're going to give him just another minute. Yeah. Uh, to, he wants to come out and play with his stick. And if he decides he doesn't want to, that's okay. And we can move forward. Do we have any other questions about copperheads before we do that? Let's see. Um, so far, we don't have any copperhead questions right now. Um, so they are one of my favorite snakes. Uh, so I think that it's really wonderful that they get to have, you have to think about, you know, the, the life out in nature is going to be so different than their life here in captivity. And I think it's so wonderful that they get to have mouse sticks and things like that to, to, um, to interest them and give them a little something to do. Yeah, I'm sure that once he decides that he wants to get up out of his bed, that he will be super, uh, Super excited that there might be a nice mouse nearby. So Katrina has a really great observation. What is the weight that's listed on the tank? That is the weight of the animal. So a lot of times when we take weights, we will write them uh, with a wet erase marker on the outside of the enclosure. Um, and that way, whenever we weigh them again, we have the previous weight easily accessible so that we can tell very quickly if the animal lost a lot of weight or gained a lot of weight. Um, it's also really beneficial when our veterinarian comes by to get tank signs. We are very lucky to have an on-site veterinarian here. Um, and so whenever he comes by to do a tank side and check on the animal and do a quick evaluation, uh, he has the weight right there uh, that he can look at while he's evaluating the animal. So cool. Yeah, we're he's actually, um, Dr. Dan Dabrowski is going to be doing uh, an exam of our emerald tree boas um, a little bit later this week. So y'all will have to tune back in for that program. Um, so Nicole wants to know, do we always provide him with a, um, with a hide? With I think it says a humid hide, or is he just in shed right now? Um, he That animal always gets a humid. So. Oh, is it? Is he opening his mouth? Oh, he just, I feel, I feel like he just yawned or yeah. gaped. <laughs> he's very sleepy. He's so cute. Um, yeah, he probably is just gaping his mouth. But yeah, that's a humid hide. It has some sphagnum moss in it. 
um, that we dampen down with a little bit of water. Um, and so if he wants to go in an area that has higher humidity, uh, he can go in there. And, but he also has the choice to go into a lower humidity area if he wants uh, to go out in the rest of his enclosure. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions before we move on to our last animal? I think we're ready to move on. All right, let's go. All right. We're going to very carefully heal through here. snakes naturally in the wild live in wetlands uh, and they spend a lot of their time in the water hence their name uh, so we're going to give her an opportunity to swim in this big pool if she wants to um, so she's got a big pool if she doesn't want to swim she's got that uh, land barge that she can get on uh, but she's deciding to get in the water right now she uh, said yes please i'll take the water <laughs> So in the wild, these guys primarily eat amphibians. Uh, and so they spend a lot of time in the water of the wetlands um, trying to find amphibians that might be there to lay their eggs. So she decides she does want to swim, but she does not want to be on camera. And that is okay too. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, I think it's so funny that, um, I mean, I think that that's really, I think it's such a natural behavior, right, to avoid being out in the open. So we're giving them this opportunity to do what they would do naturally, which is hide, right? Yeah, that's very true. Um. <laughs> I love it. So... So red-bellied water snakes are native to North Carolina. I know I live in Durham. Um, and I have seen one um, near my house, which I was very excited to see because when I looked at the range map, it actually didn't have Durham in it. <laughs> so, um, so they are native here in this area. Yeah, that's super lucky that you got to see one in Durham. It was a really, it was a really fat one too. It was fantastic. Oh, that is fantastic. Um, they are native to this area. I actually also saw one recently. Um, but I live closer to this area, um, which is also part of their range. Um, so if uh, anyone is out hiking uh, or enjoying the outdoors, you might see one of these guys. Um, you know, if you're walking in a, a really damp or watery area, um, you might see one of these guys swimming around. I saw one recently in a little creek and it was all curled up on a rock getting some sun. So these guys are pretty common to see, which is really fantastic because they are very pretty animals. They are, yeah, I love water snakes. And it's one of the, you know, I, I whenever I go hiking, I, I do try to seek out water just to find water snakes. So it's pretty right. neat. So they are, um, so they're one, well, they're really, they're very common. So we have several different species of water snakes. We have red belly, Right, and so what are the other species that folks might see when they're out hiking near some water? That's a great question. So we have northern water snakes um, around here also. Um, so they look relatively similar, but they have a bit more of a pattern on their back uh, and uh, their belly isn't red. Um, it's pretty unique to the red belly water snake. Oh yeah, she's poking her little head out. She's trying to see what we're doing. Um, oh, there she is. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that's really interesting is that juvenile red belly water snakes actually look a little bit like northern water snakes. Um, and then we also have brown water snakes around here. Um, but I don't know as much about them personally as I do about the northern and the uh, red bellies. And we have banded too, right? That is... Yes, that is correct. 
Very cool. So I have a question. I can't really tell from looking. Is her head underwater or is it above the water? Uh, she's got it out of the water right now. Okay. Because I was because I see her tongue flicking, and yeah. I was curious. Because I was like, that'd be really weird if she was doing that underwater. Okay. So it makes more sense that she's out, right? <laughs> yeah. So she. We, this is actually not very surprising. So we put her in a new place. And she immediately went to hide. And now she's getting a little bit curious. So she's poking her head out. She's trying to see what we're doing. Um, and is trying to get a grip on what's going on around here. <laughs> she's definitely checking it all out. <laughs> so, and so do, um, I know, so you were saying that, that um, red belly water snakes eat a lot of amphibians in the wild, but the, but water snakes in general will eat fish frequently, correct? Um, yes. Um, so they will eat fish. Um, so they primarily eat amphibians in the wild, but they will also eat fish in the wild. Uh, here in captivity, we feed primarily fish. Mm -hmm. um, so they do also get a vitamin supplement uh, with their fish to make sure that they get all the nutrients that they need. Um, even though that they aren't getting those amphibians in their diet that they would in the wild. Right. I think it's, I like that she's sticking her head out so we can, so we can see something here. She's peeking yeah. out. It's really, it's really cute. Yes. Yeah, so I've seen, I've seen water snakes with, um, with fish in the wild that they've caught. And it's really incredible sometimes to see the size of the prey that yeah. they'll catch relative to themselves. And I know, you know, we did the feeding program earlier. And so snakes, of course, can dislocate their jaw to swallow large prey items. But even still, I'm I'm almost always shocked by how large prey, of a prey item they can eat. Yeah, uh, they are very impressive um, with the way that they eat their food items and the water snakes are different. <laughs> she just, she's tucked back in. <laughs> She's like, nope. Well, this has been fantastic. Let me check to see if we have any more questions. Um, so uh, Missy wants to know how long can they hold their breath? What a great question. That is a fantastic question. Um, and I personally don't have a time for you. Um, I wish I did, but these guys can hold their breath for a surprisingly long amount of time. Um, so similar to the fact that reptiles use less energy than mammals do, they also on average can hold their breath longer, um, because they use a little bit less oxygen. Um, so, and these guys especially, um, are obviously really good at staying in the water. So they, since it's their natural habitat, so they can hold their breath for a surprisingly long amount of time, but unfortunately I don't have a time frame for you. All right. And so how often would um, you give her an enrichment activity like this with a little, a little dip in the pool? Um, so with this big of a pool specifically, um, not super often. Um, so most often uh, she might get something in a smaller cambro with a few rocks to crawl on. And she would get something like that, especially if she was in shed um, and needed a little help with that. Um, so a lot of times, whether whenever we do something big like this, it really varies widely depending on how much time we have that week or if we feel like an animal is showing signs that they need a little extra enrichment that week. So if we might notice that she's spending a lot of time in her water bowl, we might think that she might want to do a swim um, so there's not really a set time frame. Um, we just kind of go off of what our, how much time we have in our week and then also how the animal is acting. Very cool. And so do the non, you know, so of course water snakes are water snakes. Um, do our other non-water non snakes get to have little swimming adventures? Uh, not quite as elaborate as this. Um, a lot of our snakes that prefer to stay on land might not appreciate such a big uh, swimming area like the water snake does. Um, but a lot of our snakes do get to have small swimming adventures, uh, especially when they're in shed. Um, so warm water can really help them 
uh, shed more easily. Uh, and so most of the time, if we notice that a snake is in shed, they will get to have a small swimming adventure, but uh, not anything quite as big as this. Uh, the only other example of the animal that we give uh, a big swimming time to is our cotton mouths. Uh, so those are venomous snakes that really enjoy swimming in the water. Um, and so we have to be a little bit more careful whenever we do a pool time for a cotton mouth. Um, but we do have a big enclosure in our venomous room um, that has sealed, and we has a lid with sealed edges um, that is set up such that we can use it for um, cotton mouth enrichment. Oh, that's so fun, because they're water snakes too, of course, right? Right. So, all right, well, we are about out of time. Um, I have one more question um, from Danica. She'd like to know how old is this snake? That is a fantastic question. And we don't actually know um, how old this individual is, um, but she has been at the museum for almost three years. So she hasn't been here for super long, um, but we don't know how old she is. All right, and then I have a question for both you, you Alex, and for Raina. What are y'all's favorite reptiles or amphibians? I, I know it's a really hard question because I hate being asked that because there are too many to love. But if you oh, had to yeah. pick one. <laughs> um, if I had to pick one, I would definitely pick the Carolina Pygmy Rattlesnake as my favorite reptile. Uh, just because all of our other native rattlesnakes are so different in size. Uh, they are so much bigger. And the Carolina Pygmy Rattlesnake is so little and they warm my heart. I know, I love them so much. All right, how about you, Aina? It's probably a tie between the Eastern box turtle and it's the common rat snake. Cause I just see them all over the place and I catch them all the time when I see them, love on them, let them go. And they're just lovely animals. I love them too, I know. They're also great. I do love, I, I, whenever I um, program with animals, rat snakes are my favorite animal to program with because I feel like people um, often see them in their yards. And I feel, you know, and, if, and, and the more people can understand them, the more they'll enjoy sharing their space with those animals. Well, that is all the time we have. Thank you both so very much for taking us through these enrichment adventures. It was such a pleasure to get to see the animals exploring their activities and, and learning about why we do that and how we try to keep our animals as happy and healthy as we can in captivity. Um, so uh, this is the last program of the first day of Reptile and Amphibian Days. So we still have, uh, what, five days left. Lots of awesome programming. Um, they're going to drop a, a link in the chat box so you can sign up for some more programs. Um, and so I, uh, we, I'd like to point out we have Reptile and Amphibian Day t-shirts for sales featuring our fantastic marbled salamander. I do want to thank our museum members. Thank you so much. Um, if you are not yet a member or if you need to renew if you do it during Reptile and Amphibian Days, you get a free shirt. So it is a fantastic time to do that. Um, everyone, thank you so much. We will see you again tomorrow. And thank you, Alex and Raina. Thank you so much for hosting, Carrie. You're Bye. welcome. It was absolutely a pleasure.